This week's Torah portion is Shoftim. In the portion, we learn many laws about judges and lawyers and litigants and witnesses and courtrooms. One of the laws that we derived is highly unusual, counterintuitive, in fact, downright shocking, but highly instructive. In a capital case, meaning a case that could potentially lead to the imposition of the death penalty, we convene a minor Sanhedrin, a court of 23 judges. The judges listen to testimony from at least two witnesses who claim to have warned the wrongdoer, the defendant, and to have seen him commit the act that could lead to the death penalty. Then the judges weigh the evidence and they separate into two groups. One group consists of those judges whose initial inclination is to acquit the defendant. The other group consists of those who initially feel that conviction is warranted. And then they turn into lawyers and they argue with each other, with each group trying to persuade the other. Then they vote. If a simple majority of judges, 12 to 11, votes to acquit, then the defendant walks. He's acquitted. If a simple majority, 12 to 11, votes to convict, then he's not convicted. He can only be convicted and sentenced to death by a majority of at least two judges, which effectively in a 23-judge court means you need a three-judge majority, 13 to 10. So if the judges weigh the evidence and they split up into two groups, even if that group favoring acquittal only has one judge in it, and then they vote, nobody gets persuaded, and they vote 22 to 1 to convict, they convict the defendant, and he gets executed. But here's the quirk. If they rise and get up to split into groups, and all 23 initially favor conviction, and nobody gets up to raise a defense for the defendant, and then they vote, and the vote goes through 23 to 0, because the crime was so heinous, so outrageous, so brazen, and the testimony so unassailable, so clear, that 23 to 0, they vote to convict, the defendant walks. He gets acquitted. They cannot convict him and sentence him to the death penalty. Now, of course, if he represents a danger to society, the court is able to put him in jail. And if he really was supposed to die, we have the ultimate parachute or safety net in that God can probably figure out a way to take care of that. But we don't convict them, even though it was so clear. Why? To teach us a lesson, perhaps, that there is no person who is so irretrievably evil that he doesn't deserve a defense, some benefit of the doubt. Now, if that's true for a cold-blooded killer, then how much more so is it true in our personal lives? How much more so are we urged to give the benefit of the doubt to a friend or to a relative? And how much more so should we give the benefit of the doubt to ourselves, particularly now as we stand in Elul, the month that leads into the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, when we're going to be judged. But we're not going to be judged by some tyrant, by some trigger-happy maniac hell-bent on doing us in. We're going to be judged by God, our benevolent, loving God, who wants so desperately to give us every possible benefit of the doubt, to defend us, to stand up and argue for our acquittal. So we shouldn't give up on ourselves. No matter how bad a boy or girl you've been, it's not too late. It's never too late because God's up there not wanting to punish. He's up there waiting and wanting to give us a big hug to welcome us back because it's never too late to come back and to come home.